want to give these guys an opportunity to introduce themselves because many of you weren't able to make the conference this weekend. So take it away, brother. Virgil Walker, am I on? Maybe if I turned it on, I would be. All right. Virgil Walker, um, the executive director of operations for G3 Ministries. A G3 stands for Gospel, Grace, and Glory. It, is a, it started out as a conference-based ministry, which now produces all kinds of resources for local churches. If you want to learn more, you can go to G3MIN, G the, uh, G the number three, M-I-N dot O-R-G, and get all kinds of free stuff. But as we're uh, promoting our, our um, resources, uh, one of the things that we have is G3 Press, where we're publishing great books uh, and the like. And uh, we're excited to have this guy next to me as one of our authors for the book Stand. And uh, last service, I, you know, I teased the fact that Y'all clap for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I teased out that that uh, we were the number one book on uh, G3 Press, but someone is really quickly on our heels regarding that. I'm sure that uh, that he's excited about that. No, we're excited about that as well. Couldn't be more uh, proud of, of what uh, John is doing with that book and and uh, and how you all are, are helping to promote that. So great job there. I am the husband of Tamika Walker. Tamika is back. Uh, in Douglasville, where we reside, Douglasville, Georgia, just 45 minutes west of Atlanta. And uh, we have three children, uh, and adult children are in our, our adult children are in Omaha, Nebraska, where I'm from. If you're familiar with the Just Thinking podcast, which I'm the co-host of with this gentleman next to me, um, they, they call me Omaha or Omahizi if you, if you listen to the <laughs> podcast. And, uh, and so my, I've got two, two kids that are there, uh, Princess, my oldest daughter, and then Princeton, uh, oldest son, so second born, but oldest son uh, there, and they're there in Omaha. And then my youngest son m made the move with us. He still had a year of high school to finish by the time of the move, and so uh, he's there with us in, in Douglasville. His name is Price. So I've got Princess, Princeton, and Price. All three of them come running after, you know, you say one of them's names, everybody <laughs> just, comes, <laughs> just comes running and figure out what's going on. Um, in addition to that, I love co-hosting the Just Thinking podcast uh, with this guy. It's an absolute joy and a privilege and to get to travel around, meet great people like you, uh, and be encouraged by what God has done through uh, the, the podcast. Good morning, everyone. I'm Daryl Harrison. I serve as a director of digital platforms for Grace to You, which is the uh, Bible teaching ministry of Dr. John MacArthur uh, back in Southern California. I've been associated with Grace to You for a little over three years. I'm originally from Atlanta. My wife, Melissa, is here with me. So we're originally from Atlanta, but are really enjoying the freedom of Arizona right now. Uh, yes, this is, a, this is a free state compared to California. Uh, so that's my day job, but as a Virgil alluded to earlier, I also co-host the Just Thinking podcast, which some of you may be familiar with. Show of hands, so familiar with the Just Thinking podcast. Wow, great. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with the podcast, haven't listened to us, you may escort yourselves out the back doors. I think there's, what, five entrances, so you shouldn't have to bump into one another as you do that. No, no seriously, the, uh, the Just Thinking podcast has been around in December, will be five years. I encourage you to uh, download it if you're a podcast listener. Uh, take your podcast app, just do a search for Just Thinking and uh, subscribe, or you can go to justthinking.me, justthinking.me. Click the podcast tab, and there are our entire library of 120 episodes you can find there. Uh, Melissa and I have three adult children. They're all back in Georgia. When we relocated to California, we left all our family and friends back in Georgia. We have Colin, Naomi, and Yasmin uh, who are back, uh, back in uh, metro Atlanta uh, holding it down while we're here on the West Coast. And it's an absolute joy and privilege for us to be here at Redeemer uh, Church. This place is unique. I just want to tell you that Virgin I travel to dozens of churches every year. This place is unique, so it's a privilege, honor for us to uh, to be here with you this weekend. My name is Pastor Jack Hughes of Anchor Bible Church. Most of you women know my wife, Lisa. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> So, yeah, I pastor uh, a church there, and uh, you know, that's a little bit about me. I have three children, been married 38 years, my two boys living in Washington State, and my daughter is about ready to have our third grandchild, so I'm waiting for that text message any moment. <laughs> well, guys, we have, um, yes. 
Well, guys, we have a question here. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to read it. I think it will I think it'll be helpful if I just read it. My daughter has denied Christ to live in a same-sex relationship and pursue Buddhism. There are differing opinions as to how I am to handle this as a believer and mother. Uh, win her to the Lord by forcing her out of the family and see her sinful ways, or win her to the Lord by loving her unconditionally, uh, etc. Will you please address being a light in this kind of darkness? Wow. Well, we didn't start out easy, did we? No. <laughs> no. Um, th- there are a number of things that, uh, that um, I can say about that. First of all, my heart absolutely goes out to you uh, in that situation and in that environment. Um, as we've talked about this weekend, as Daryl has mentioned, the importance of exegeting culture. I think there are a number of factors that we have to consider. Um, one of which is when we say love unconditionally, uh, what do we mean, right? Um, what does that look like to love unconditionally? Does that require uh, affirming a, a lifestyle that is, is antithetical to, to biblical faith or belief uh, or, or you know, what you know to be true about the word of God, is that, is that what that means? To affirm what you know to be sinful? Um, or can that mean loving um, you know, your, your, your daughter uh, in a way that does honor God because she is indeed your daughter and will forever be, while at the same time holding to a biblical worldview? With this, I mean, there, there are a number of thoughts that come to mind. The, my first thought is initially to go to scripture. And, and so we definitely want to go to scripture and, and define uh, what, what it, re- regarding relationships, what God honors as relationship between a husband and a wife, Genesis 2, and, and we see Adam and Eve, and, and, and we see the nature of their relationship and what God designed. Well, we can go to um, Ephesians chapter 5 and look at the role of husband and wife and what that was to portray uh, uh, for us based upon Scripture. So the, all of those things should undergird the, the, your thought process about a, a biblical view of love, a biblical view of marriage, a biblical view of identity. Um, God created them in, in the image of God, Genesis 1, 20, 28, 27, 28. So all of those things can be true, and there's some things that come out of that that can be true as well. Um, I'll give you, in addition to Scripture, some personal testimony, and I know that um, both Daryl and I have shared this history uh, about ourselves on the podcast, so it won't be any surprise to anyone here. I have a younger brother, had a younger brother. My, yo- my younger brother has passed away. Um, due to complications based upon uh, uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, And so he passed away about five years ago. And uh, all during our lives, uh, you know, there was this wrestle with, um, with homosexuality. And, and how he was, how he presented himself and all of that. Now, again, I think the role of a mother is different than the role of a brother, uh, but some of the behaviors and decisions that, that, that we made as a result were no different in that one, that's my brother. And regardless of how he presented himself or who made fun of him, you, you'd have to fight me if you had something to say about him, right? Why? Because I, I love him as the Imago Dei, as a, as a brother created in the image of God for whom no one should disrespect. He should, he should be able to live with value, dignity, and respect. Unfortunately, what the culture means by love is they mean to affirm behavior. So if I'm unwilling to affirm behavior, then I'm considered by the world as unloving. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't even hold water because uh, when you have children, there are all kinds of behaviors that you don't like that they do, and you correct those behaviors while still at the same time loving them. So as it pertains to sexuality, we have this idea that there's a requirement to affirm homosexuality as the only form of loving uh, the, your, 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 your child. I love my brother. I would back him on anything. I did not affirm his behavior. It was indeed in our home as well. Sinful behavior and spoken about as such consistently from a biblical worldview. Now, did we, uh, were we angry or were we always fighting? No, we, we, we loved him. But when the issue of sexuality came up, 
we always affirmed what the scripture had to say about those things. Let me tell you the other thing that we would not be willing to do. We would not be willing to embrace that lifestyle under the umbrella of our home. Which means, because of the fact that our home was a space where we had made a decision to live in a biblical worldview from a Christian perspective, we did not choose to bring uh, uh, him and, and some other uh, you know, uh, person that he quote unquote loved and present them as anything other than either friends. If there was a framework by which they were to be presented as lovers or boyfriends or anything, that would not that he would know prior to coming that that would not be welcomed in our home because that's not the worldview by which we live that's how we manage things now he was always welcome his friend was always welcome if they were going to present in any way that de that defied how the bible uh, prescribed uh, a relationship between two men that was not to be expressed in our home um, he knew that, understood that, and, and dealt with that. Unfortunately for him, he uh, would come home, l live a lifestyle that was right, and then later on choose to do something crazy and chaotic, and it would eventually lead to him, you know, his, his life uh, ending due to complications uh, based upon AIDS. I share that story not for, uh, not, not for people to be sad or saddened or, or particularly um, um, you know, the, the, the concern that you would have for me. But I share that story to say that there is a way by which we can engage relationships in a loving way, in a biblical way, that provides the, the framework for some, a, a non-believer to eventually come to Christ. Here's the, here's the good side of that story. Because of the way that we lived our lives, he always knew <coughs> what was right and what was wrong. And what, I, what we would get, the report back that we would get was toward the end of his life, he, he did make that, that repentance, that confession of faith. I do have hope that I'll see my brother again in heaven. I do believe if we had affirmed it, if we'd embraced it, if we'd have told him, hey, that's no problem. God made you that way. You're going to be okay. It's all good. And God sees things differently and changed what the Bible had to say. You know, there, there's somebody who biblically interpreted that in a wrong way. And so you need to look at it in this new light. Uh, there would be no hope that, that I could ever see my brother again. One, one last thing that I'll say about this, and that is that, that, is that none of these things are easy. Not a one of them. And, and when you're dealing especially with family, it's, it's especially challenging. Uh, my mom had, had a difficult time uh, navigating this, more so than my dad. I could tell you more stories about this, but the reality is these kinds of issues are going to continue to affect our lives. And if we as believers in Christ don't have the resolve that Scripture is sufficient, that we have a, a standard by which we operate, and that what is loving is not what the world tells us is love, which means to affirm sinful behavior that's what the world means by loving that we, and we are we need to have a willingness to stand on what scripture says is loving and that is to share truth in love um, and and understand that you can love that person as the imago day hold on to biblical truth uh, embrace them but maintain a standard of biblical fidelity in your home uh, that honors god Beautifully said, uh, V, and I appreciate your transparency in sharing that incredibly personal story. So Virgil uh, mentioned that he and I do have, we have a lot of things in common, and one of those things is that experience. Like he had a younger brother who died uh, from complications of HIV AIDS. I had an older brother who died of complications of HIV AIDS. He died at the age of 34 years old. Um, John, I've been contemplating what this question was since we broke from the last Q&A, from the first Q&A this morning. That, your te teeing up that question has ne never left my mind since you mentioned it. Um, I've got multiple places that I want to take you this morning. I'll try to do that expeditiously to give my brother Jack <clears throat> some time to, to comment on this. Um, for those of you who are at the conference this weekend, you heard one of the sessions um, um, that I facilitated, I gave a message uh, where I focused on how we make an idol of God's love. How we have a propensity, if not a tendency to, uh, depending on the situation and circumstance, we tend to segment 
God's love and separate and partition those, uh, that attribute from his other attributes. <clears throat> in that we tend to only see God as a God of love uh, at the expense of seeing him as a God who is holy, who is just, who is righteous, who is wrathful, and on, on, on and on, uh, his attributes are infinite. But in that message, I shared a quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon. Um, Spurgeon. Spurgeon said this. He said, all true love, and this connects back to what Virgil just very adroitly stated with respect to how his love for his brother was not boundaryless. His brother knew that there was a biblical line of demarcation that he, as the head of that home, had drawn in such a way that his love for his brother was not a blank check for his brother to bring his, what we must have to honestly and openly say, his sinful behavior into his home. That would have been contradictory and hypocritical on Virgil's part had he allowed that to happen. But Spurgeon said this, he said, all true love goes towards purification. And the true love of God goes that way with an invincible current that can never be turned aside. O oh, believer, your God loves you so well that he will not let a darling sin stay in your heart. He loves you so strongly that he will not spare any iniquity in you. Now, I have an encouragement, an admonishment, and an exhortation. The encouragement is for the, question, the person who submitted the question. My encouragement to you is that you must reflect the same type of love that Spurgeon's talked about towards your daughter. You must reflect and exhibit towards her the kind of biblical love that will not allow a darling sin to stay in her heart. You will not affirm that sin, in other words. You must love her the same way God loves her. God loves her so much, Spurgeon said, that he will not spare any iniquity in her. All that to say is that your love for her must not affirm her sin. You cannot. That is not biblical love. Now, I say that on the basis of several texts, and I'm going to try to get through these really quickly. I want to take you <laughs> I want to take you to, I thought I wanted to take you to a Proverbs is where I thought I wanted to go, but I guess I didn't book, bookmark it. But in the meantime, I do want to take you to uh, Romans 6. I want to take you to Romans 6. Here is the, um, and before, before, I, before I get to Romans 6, I want to speak to that daughter. Virgil alluded to the Imago Dei in Genesis 127. And I want to speak to that daughter and anyone here who may be uh, in sort of a shared uh, emotional space as this daughter is. Genesis 127 does declare that God created each of us. He created humanity, male and female, in his image. But it also says that in doing that, that God blessed them. Now, why is that important? That's important because I want to say to that daughter and to anyone else who's listening is that as, 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 a, as, a, as an image bearer of God, there is no higher affirmation you can receive other than God blessed you when he created you in his image. There is no greater affirmation than that. So I beg you to realize that, that you're being created in the image of God. That Hebrew word blessed in Genesis 127, it carries the picture of God actually stooping over, bending down, and placing his hand upon his creation. He condescended. God came low. He came low. He came down to us. And he blessed you. He blessed you in creating you as a male. He blessed you as creating you in creating you as a female in his image. There is no greater affirmation than that. Now, here's the tough part. The admonishment here. Again, speaking to that daughter, speaking to that daughter, 
Romans 6, 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. That's exactly what this daughter is guilty of right now. She's guilty of disobeying this exhortation. She's presenting her body to the obedience of her lusts, the lusts of her flesh. That's exactly what's happening here. And see, here's the tough part. And I love what Virgil said. I said, none of this is easy. We love these people. We love them. You love them. Nine times out of ten, these are relatives and friends who, who we would take a bullet to the head for. You love them that much. And sometimes it, it hurts to receive the truth, but sometimes it hurts to give the truth. But here's, here's the thing. Here's what should, something that should soften the blow as we give the truth to others is you need to ri- remind yourself that we're talking about eternity here. We're not just talking about interrupting their lifestyle in a temporal way here on earth. This is an eternal dilemma that we're talking about. Why do I say that? Well, follow me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'm going to take you to verses 19. And 20. Now, here's the exhortation to the mother, to the parent, to the, to the submitter of the question. Here's my exhortation to you. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. This is why this, this whole issue of this relationship that she's in is an eternal issue, a matter of eternity. James writes, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back. Let me pause there. This, this is what that parent is trying to do. When, when she talks, here she talks about winning that daughter over. They're trying to turn this daughter back. You're trying to exhort the daughter to repent. You're trying to encourage the daughter to turn away from this lifestyle. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. That's what makes this a, a matter of eternity. So we're not just talking about lifestyle here. We're talking about eternity. And see, but we tend to idolize God's love in such a way that we want to affirm people in their sin under the, under the umbrella of love, but not tell them that there's going to be a price to pay for the lifestyle that they're living. Now, this isn't Daryl chapter 5. This is James chapter 5, so I didn't write this. He says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways. And by the way, that's a biblical definition of what evangelism is. Evangelism is a, you're, you're endeavoring to turn, by, by the word of God, turning a sinner from the error of his way. That's a simple definition of what evangelism is. Who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So this is a matter of eternity being at stake here. This is not easy. My heart, I concur with my brother. My heart goes out to this parent who's obviously shed tears. I can tell that they've shed tears over this situation. But at the same time, like Spurgeon said, your love for your daughter cannot abide sin, unrepentant sin in their life. If you truly love them, you will tell them the truth. You would encourage them to repent, and you would establish loving boundaries uh, for that daughter, uh, because as we said in the first Q&A, uh, the, the truth of the gospel is going to divide people. And, and you, you can't affirm on the one hand and then call it love biblically on the other hand. It's like oil and water. Yeah, there's some things. Let me just add to what these men have said already. One is, as a parent, you love your children. And uh, let's just say kind of ideal situation 
you've been a Christian ever since your children were born. You raised them to love the Lord. You taught them the Bible. This is you know, kind of a best case scenario. Um, you teach them, you train them. I know parents who have been excellent parents and some of their children know the Lord and one of them doesn't or two of them doesn't. Because as a parent, you, you can't save your children. And you can't expect your child, if they don't know the Lord, to walk with the Lord. You want them to walk with the Lord, but they don't. And it makes you frustrated. You fear for their soul. You get passionate. That's why we need to speak the truth in love. And love is patient. It is kind. It is not jealous. It is not provoked. Um, and so when you're speaking truth, and again, you know, I don't know all the details, but let's say you have just a child who's in the home and that child decides, I don't want God. I don't want Jesus. I want to pursue this lifestyle. I don't want, well, you're the parent. And so you get to call the shots in your own home. You can clamp down as much as you want. Take away their phone, take away their computer, take away their stuff. You, you do not let sin be promoted in your home. Okay, that, that's something you just can't do, okay, because it's your home. But what about when they, they leave home? Because a lot of times it happens that they will be restrained by your exhortations, by your authority as parents, and as soon as they leave, they just jump off the rail and jump into this sin or that behavior or this false religion or whatever, how are you to process that? Well, you process that. One of the helpful ways to do that is to realize when your child does not know the Lord, they are held captive by Satan to do his will. The whole world of unbelieving men lies in the power of the evil one. They are spiritually dead, and therefore they walk according to, to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You, you have to come to grips with that as uncomfortable as it is and not get angry at them because they're acting according to their nature. Let me just give you an example here. Let's say you had a, a, you know, a, a child who you know, grew up or whatever, and all of a sudden they got leukemia. Would you get mad at them? Would you, would you rebuke them? Would you get very emotional and say, how can you got a Well, I, it's like, I'm sorry. I didn't choose this. It happened. Well, in kind of a similar way, when you have an unbelieving child, they're going to act like unbelievers. And it's actually better for them to act like an unbeliever than to pretend to be a believer when they're not. So how do you deal with that? You try to maintain the relationship because truth flows through relationships. So I know there's a part that you just want to just, you know, get out the ax and, you know, just throw it down and say, my way or the highway. But what are you really asking them to do? Do you really want them to pretend to be a Christian when they're not? Do you really want them to be a Pharisee? who doesn't know the Lord, but does what you want because it's more comfortable for you. I'm not saying, you know, let them set up a, you know, sacrificial altar to Satan in the living room. But I'm just saying, you know, you, you need to think through this. Am I, am I wanting to require them to do what, according to their nature, is impossible for them? Because those who don't know lo the Lord, um, they can't please God in anything because they're at enmity with God. They're hostile to God. They're not able to please him, Romans 8, 5 through 8. They, they're, they can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness. Moronic is the Greek word. Uh, they're moronic to them. Okay, so pray for them. Pray for them. Be a good example to them and speak the truth to them. Prayer Example, truth. And don't participate in any evil deeds in your household. But if they go outside, you know what? Just love them because they're just like every other person who's led astray. 
whether it be into Mormonism or Satanism or you know, any other ism or lifestyle, sinful lifestyle, it doesn't matter if you're a super moral person who, you know, is, you know, dresses nice and speaks nice. If you don't know the Lord, that person's on the way to hell, just like the Satan worshiper. Okay. They both need the gospel. They both need loved and by love, a biblical definition, the truth spoken to them in the fruit of the spirit repeatedly and prayed for and hopefully God by his grace will bring them to repentance my encouragement in that for the parent is not to bend the knee on this the biblical standard that you maintain for your home often in the name of maintaining relationship we will bend the standard in other words we'll and, and I'll give you an example that I'll make I'll, I'll go ahead and make everybody mad here in a second so it's Thanksgiving, and your son, your heterosexual son, brings his heterosexual girlfriend to your Thanksgiving event <clears throat> with the intent of them staying over the night, unmarried, in the same room. And that's okay. Because you're maintaining, while you wish they would get married, you, your hope is that, you know, they, uh, you want to maintain relationship. So the best way to do that is to let them in your home, in the same room, cohabitating in that way. There's no framework for that, biblically speaking. In the same way, we've got to think about those kinds of things as parents from a standpoint of, if we're not going to, va if, if we're not going to validate the, the homosexual relationship, we should not validate, that's, a, that's outside of the biblical framework of husband and wife then we should not validate the same-sex relationship that has no biblical basis whatsoever. I can maintain all kinds of relationships, but I don't have to allow sinful behavior and activity to happen under the framework of my home, and that would be my encouragement. Yes, we talk about any, uh... Just let everyone in a little secret. I turn these, when I'm not talking, I turn the mic off in case I accidentally drop because I accidentally drop it and it doesn't go like boom because it's still on. So I turn it off in case I'm a klutz up here and, and, and drop the mic. But um, we, we talked this weekend about how uh, uh, the past two years over the whole, two, two and a half years over the whole COVID uh, uh, time, timeline and time frame that uh, and, and I made the comment, don't blame these guys. So if you guys get angry, you can get angry with me. But I articulated that one of the things that I observed over the past two years about, is that how a lot of believers, it, it turned out that their beliefs weren't convictions. The beliefs weren't convictions. Situations presented themselves. Uh, they caved to the pressure of the government to do whatever. Uh, some of you may have been following the situation with Grace Community Church out in L.A. Uh, where the government tried to pressure uh, John MacArthur and the elders there to close their church and just shut the doors. Obviously, we didn't do that. And by God's grace, we ended up winning the lawsuit. Um, but there were other instances where churches uh, just demonstrated that their beliefs weren't convictions. Um, this parent is facing the same situation. Only very close, much, much closer than a, than a church or a, a community. She's facing a situation whereby if she professes to be a believer in Christ, or is what I say I believe a conviction or is it merely situation ethics? That's the, that's the situation you're in. And to put it bluntly, God doesn't care that this is your daughter. His word is clear. That homosexuality is sin. His word is clear on that. Your love for your daughter does not supersede or uh, render impotent God's word. So what you have to do is decide, is what you say you believe a conviction or is it just situation ethics? And uh, like I said, like Virgil has said, we've all said this. Easier said than done. 
But see, here's the deal. According to Romans 14, 12, each of us is going to give an account of ourselves to God. Now, is your accountability that you are going to give to God according to Hebrews 9, 27? That is, 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 is accounted for each person to die and then after that to judgment. So you have to say, is the risk of disobeying God in this situation worth what you're going to be accountable, held accountable to him for? Um, so just something to think about. John, I'll hand it over to you, but I did find that proverb that I wanted to go to earlier. It's Proverbs 10, Proverbs 10, verses 16 and 17. And this actually pairs well with James 5, verses 19 and 20. Proverbs 10, verses 16 and 17 says that the wages of the righteous is life. The income of the wicked is punishment. He is on the path of life who heeds instruction, but he who ignores reproof goes astray. So I'll commit that to that parent or anyone else who, here who may have an affinity for that situation themselves. Proverbs 10, verses 16 and 17, and uh, study that in the context uh, alongside James 5, 19 and 20. So guys, I want to continue on the theme of family. This question is, uh, what is the purpose of raising your children in the faith when God has already decided if he will save them or not? I'll start on that one. <laughs> so, yeah, you are to train up your child in the way they should go. Um, so that hopefully when they are old, they will not depart from that way. Um, you teach them to be honest. You teach them to pray. You teach them to respect others, to work hard. You prepare them to live a normal life in the world, you know, how to cook, how to clean, how to, you know, balance their bank account, things like that. You give them basic life skills. Um, all of these things God tells you to do, not because those things save your child, but because they are right, because they give glory to God. Um, your, your response or your responsibility as a parent is to live the truth and speak the truth to your children, expose them to the truth, train them in the truth. It's God's job, and this is what Daryl was talking about. I can't remember if it was this, what session, this session, or the so one before, right? Session, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, they're blending together. Um, but, but, but your job is not to save or sanctify people. You, you cannot save your child. You can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. You know, you can say, this is Jesus, and try to model for your children what is right. So as parents, you need to train your child and the message of predestination, election, is for believers, not for unbelievers. It's not a gospel. Now, this is why Calvin, when he wrote his Institutes, for instance, put it way at the end of the third section. Okay, Once you come to Christ, this is an encouragement for you. I, I like the... The, the great illustration, I think, it was Moody who did it. And he said, the sign above heaven is, you know, come to me, all you are weak and heavy laden, repent and believe and be saved. And when you go through that gate and you do what the sign says and you look back at the backside of the sign, it says chosen before the foundation of the world. But that, that message, God's election God, his predestination of who is and who isn't saved is not a gospel. It is not the means by which we first determine who is elect so we can save the gospel with them. Nor is it a reason to reject Christ. You can't say, well, uh, since I'm not elect, well, repent and you'll know you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know what there is to All add right. to that. I mean, that was, <laughs> that, that was pretty much fire. So I've got a family worship question. Um, what is your take on family worship? Um, is family worship important? If so, how recommendations for how to do it? Bird, you might want to take that. You're a former discipleship pastor, man. That's right up your alley, right? 
One of the books that I would encourage every man to purchase, uh, Bodie's, Bodie Bauckham's book on um, uh, family-driven faith. Uh, there's another book about, about uh, is it Family Shepherds? Mm -hmm. Is that the one? Mm -hmm. Family Shepherds, it's kind, of the, it's kind of the byproduct. It really introduced me almost, gosh, eight, ten years ago to uh, what it means to have family worship. Um, is it important? Absolutely. I mean, Scripture is, is, is replete with, with information about, about uh, mothers and fathers discipling their children and teaching them in the way that they should go and, and opening up the Scriptures and, and telling them about the goodness of God. That's everywhere. And so what does that look like for a family? I think it, for, I, I can use my family as an example. I think early on when they were um, you know, young, um, first, second, third grade, uh, maybe my daughter was was you know middle school. Uh, it was brief. It was short. Uh, it was for us. It was once a week. I, and now I'm, I'm noticing that there are others who practice it daily. I think you've got to think about it for the rhythm of your family. There are some who I talk to who every you know at dinner as they get gathered together, there's some form of family worship. And so whatever works for your family, uh, make that so. For us, it was a weekly event that at the end of the week we would we would gather together. We would read the scripture. Uh, there would be a song, uh, and you don't want to hear me sing. And so th there, would be, there would be a song, uh, a scripture reading, prayer. And for the little kids, uh, there was scripture memory, and I catechized uh, my, my children, walked them through you know, what, what the, the Bible, what does it mean, answer specific questions, and kind of did that. The older that they've gotten, we just modified. Sometimes they would ask questions. Those questions would become longer conversations, and maybe now rather than a than a 12 to 15 minute sit down, it's a 30 or 40 minute conversation that we've had over time. Um, I've since that time, uh, Daryl and I had the benefit of going to uh, someone's home uh, when we were traveling, and there was there were older uh, adults. There were three generations. There was there were children. Uh, 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 Adults who were about about our age in their their forties, fifties, uh, and and then there there was a, the gr the grandparents. Yeah, we were in Dallas, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. Right I now. was so moved by the conversation that we had as they shared about what was going on with with them and their family, and how the the, the grandparents actually maintained through the COVID period and all of that connection with the entire family. I was so convicted. Uh, I raced back home because what I what I think about, I thought, oh, that was a, family worship was important when everybody was under the same roof, but now that I've got some in Omaha, I've got some here, we'll just kind of let it go, and uh, I was I was truly convicted to at least get on a Zoom call, and have even my kids who are far away join me weekly for a conversation about Scripture, and so I'm taking them through a you know, book of the Bible. We're having conversation, and I was shocked by my intent was to keep them for 15, 20 minutes. You make it longer than that, folks get restless. Okay, we're going to have an hour-long service, and here's what we're going to do. 15, 20 minutes, quick scripture reading. How are you all doing? How can I be praying for you? Great. Now, once I did that, of course, they begin to ask the questions. What does that scripture mean, Dad? I mean, I was hearing about this, and then we continue an con ongoing conversation. So what I've learned is... But even as they're outside of our home, there's a manner in which we can maintain a connection uh, around the scripture, uh, around the reading of God's word, around prayer uh, that, that, connect, that, that continues to connect our family together. And it's been a tremendous blessing. I don't know if I answered the question well. Great. Yeah, just a couple of verses in Ecclesiastes uh, come to mind. Ecclesiastes 11 verses 9 and 10. And I cite these verses because it's not just the exercise of family worship, but you also have to consider why is it that you are, as Virgil mentioned, why are you gathering around the, the table or virtually via Zoom to uh, worship with your family and take your children through the word of God? Well, Ecclesiastes 9, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 11 verses 9 and 10 says, Rejoice, young man, during your childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body. Because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. That's why you do family worship. Because you are trying to instill within your children 
a, 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 an affinity for eternity, an affinity for one day that they're going to die. One day, and, and I would encourage this to parents to understand that your child is not just flesh and blood. I remember something, well, I don't remember him saying it. I wasn't old enough to remember him saying it, but something I read by James Brown, uh, the old inter late entertainer James Brown said, he said, we work so hard to feed our family one way that we forget to feed them the other way with spiritual nourishment. So everybody needs that. So parents, remember, when you, when you see your children, don't just see a flesh and blood human being. You are shepherding a child that has a soul. And that soul one day is going to face God alone by himself or herself to give account of themselves. And I say that again, staying in Ecclesiastes, going to Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. The writer says, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments. That's a great, succinct, biblical definition of what catechizing is is you are encouraging your children to fear God and to keep his commandments. Why? Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. I just want to make a quick yeah. comment here. A lot of times we think of family worship as a structured time that you sit down and we're going to have, and that's fine. It's fine to do that. But I, I want to encourage you with this text here as they're, uh, Israel's getting ready to enter in the promised land, and there's what is called the great Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then, then we read this. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be like frontals on your foreheads. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then it keeps going. But the whole point is this. As a parent, try to bring God's word into everything. You can have times, and we did that, or read good books and stop and talk to your kids about them. Have discussions at the, we did a lot of our stuff at the, the table, you know, it's like, okay, let's talk about repentance. You know, we'll start with the youngest child. What's repentance? I don't know, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> you're sorry. Okay, anything else? Okay, go up to the next oldest kid, the next oldest kid. We, we just talked about that. We talked about counseling things. We listened to sermons when we were driving around. We said, okay, here's this beggar. How should we think about that person with the cardboard sign there? What does the Bible say about the lazy, the idle, the, idle, the indolent, the sluggard? Um, how are we to treat a person like that who can work but won't? Um, you know, just you, you bring God's word into everything in your life. It's, it, and don't just isolate it to the shot in the arm on Sunday or this little speck of time that, you know, we're going to sit down and we're going to study Leviticus. <laughs> it's okay if you have three little boys to talk about David and Goliath and, you know, some of the more exciting things in Scripture. You know, there's a lot in the Bible you can do. So just... Study that text in Deuteronomy 6 and just see what it's saying. Teach them my word all the time. But in order for that to happen, it must first be on your heart. You learn it, model it, teach them globally. And that can include formal times also. Can you guys thank our speakers? Thank you guys very much.